Last week, we saw God rescue his servants, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the blazing furnace. At the end of the story, we saw King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon taking early steps of faith, making a dramatic decree. Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be the God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other god can save this way. No other god can save this way. The start of faith there in Nebuchadnezzar, recognizing who God is, promising signs of faith. But Daniel chapter 4 reminds us that it often takes more than one step of faith before a person comes to proper repentance. And this chapter takes the form of a letter that Nebuchadnezzar himself wrote as a testimony of the way that the one true God was going to transform his life. Uh, Daniel 4 verse 2, it's my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. That's the statement of faith which Nebuchadnezzar comes to at the end of the events that he relates in Daniel chapter 4. That'll be where the story is going. But Nebuchadnezzar had to meet God in a new way before he'd reached that point. His life was going very, very well, but then he had another dream and that terrified him. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked and there was before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter and the birds lived in all its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. A very distressing dream for Nebuchadnezzar, this mighty tree which was bringing blessing to everything so tall it was even touching the sky. Some have described this as a cosmic tree, a, a manifestation, if you like, of the whole of creation. Yet in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the tree will fall into ruin. And the heavenly messenger announces that the tree will fall under God's judgment. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decisions announced by messengers, the holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives to them, to anyone he wishes, and sets them over the lowliest of people. It's down to God's servant Daniel to interpret this dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel tells him that the tree represents King Nebuchadnezzar himself and the whole of his empire. And the dream's a solemn warning that God's judgment was going to fall on Nebuchadnezzar himself because of his pride. The king had become proud and arrogant, so Daniel warns him, therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice, renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. A dream from God that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was going to fall because of his pride and arrogance. But sadly, Nebuchadnezzar ignores the warning of the dream and God's judgment did fall. So Nebuchadnezzar, looking back, could write 12 months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, 
Is this not the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? And even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. And immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle, his nails like the claws of a bird. God's judgment fell on Nebuchadnezzar. It isn't clear whether seven times means seven years or seven of other periods of time. In any case, it was a long, long time when Nebuchadnezzar's mind was disturbed some psychologists call this lycanthropy, turning into a werewolf even. Some sort of psychological disturbance which beset Nebuchadnezzar and a long time before he would come to his senses and repent. But in the end, that did happen. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my hands towards heaven and my sanity was restored. And then I praised the Most High. I honoured and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Nebuchadnezzar came to the point where he recognised that God was indeed sovereign. That anything that he, Nebuchadnezzar, had, anything in the great Babylonian Empire, was only by the permission of the one true God of heaven. True repentance. Nebuchadnezzar acknowledging that God Most High, the God of Abraham and Isaac, Jacob and Daniel, the God of the Jews, is indeed the one true God. And only when that happens does God restore Nebuchadnezzar. At that same time, he says, my sanity was restored, my honour and splendour were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my advisers and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble there's the moral from the story those who walk in pride he is able to humble a reminder that almighty god is indeed sovereign over the whole of creation he is indeed king of kings and lord of lords the lamb upon the throne God is on the throne. God is in charge of history. That's the testimony of the whole of the Bible. That's the testimony of the book of Daniel for those exiles trying to learn how to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. That's the testimony for all of God's people in every age in times of trouble. But that does leave us with some interesting questions. Is God still on the throne? Is God still sovereign over history? And if so, why doesn't God intervene in the world today? Why doesn't God humble tyrants today in the way that he humbled Nebuchadnezzar? Why doesn't God intervene today to prevent wars and suffering around the world? To answer those questions, I think we need to remember the one decisive event in human history when God did intervene, when God became a human being in our Lord Jesus Christ. God became man and died for our salvation and rose again 
from the dead and now is exalted on high king of kings and lord of lords but since jesus came we've not seen god intervening in human history in the same way as he did in the time of abraham and isaac and jacob not as he did in the time of the exodus rescuing and creating his chosen people not in the time of king david giving victory over the philistines in miraculous ways not as in the time of elijah and elisha uh, bringing victory to god's holy people and not in the way as we've just read in the time of daniel uh, in the life of nebuchadnezzar god doesn't seem to intervene in those ways in history anymore because he's already made that definitive intervention in the incarnation and when god became a human being in jesus christ for us for our salvation everything changed up until that point god's relationships had been with his chosen people the nation of israel the jewish people and up until that point god had intervened sometimes to protect his people to save them or sometimes as in the case of the events of the exile to bring judgment on his people to purify them so that only the faithful remnant would come to know god that was god's way under the old covenant in the times of moses and david and elijah and elisha and daniel god dealt with kingdoms god dealt with individual kings but since then since jesus came that isn't the way that god works because now he's made it possible for every individual to come into a relationship with him through jesus it's not about jews and non-jews jews and gentiles anyone can put their faith in christ and find salvation find new life and since then god does not seem to intervene on behalf of one people or another people god does not intervene in miraculous ways to stop wars although he touches the lives of individuals he does still sometimes speak in dreams and visions to individuals to bring them to repentance but god does not seem to intervene as perhaps we might hope with the tyrants of the world there are many leaders through history one could obviously think of adolf hitler and just wish that god had intervened to humble hitler so that the second war would not have taken place there are tyrants around the world today and what god could wish that one could wish that god would intervene to stop their brutality of their own people or stop the wars between nations but God does not seem to work that way now. Because now each one, each individual can come to put their faith in Christ. And God is less concerned, it seems, with, with the fate of nations, with the destiny of nations. God is now concerned with individuals coming to know Him. And I offer this speculation if god were to intervene in a dramatic in a spectacular way in in some international scene if god were to intervene to end the conflict in syria or to end the conflict in israel and palestine right now if god were to intervene that would reveal his power and his glory in a way which would perhaps in some mysterious way change the dynamics with human beings if god's power to be seen by every eye and everybody were to know 
yes, there is a God in heaven who will intervene for the poor, for the powerless. Then from that point on, the relationships between God and human beings would be changed. It would no longer be a matter of faith, uh, of accepting the truth of scripture, of coming to know Jesus in a personal relationship. If the God of heaven were to reveal himself to be on the throne so that everybody could see it and nobody could deny it, then the relationship of faith, which brings human beings to become God's children, would not be the same. So maybe there's my speculation that God chooses not to intervene. God looks and sees the, the sadness of human suffering, the, the tragedy of war, the injustice of oppression. And God remains angry about that. God remains sad about these things. But he chooses to in, not to intervene. He wants people to come to faith in Christ rather than just respond to what they see of the power of God at work in the world. God wants to wait for people to come to repentance in themselves. He doesn't want to, if you like, force their hands by acting in miraculous ways, by intervening in human history. We can't understand the ways of God. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But that's my reflection on why we don't see God intervening in Israel and Palestine, in Syria, in Yemen. Why we've not seen God intervene in our generations, in the wars of the world, or to bring down tyrants. God has a greater master plan. And in that master plan, one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, every eye will see that Jesus Christ is Lord. That day is coming. But until that day, God chooses to remain hidden. He chooses to invite human beings to come to know him, to put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. God chooses not to intervene in dramatic ways. And who are we to tell God how to work? Who are we to say that God is wrong in all these things? His dominion is an eternal king dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing, and he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold his, back his hand or say to him, what have you done? This is the God of the Bible, mysterious sometimes. Sometimes hard to understand. The God who invites us to trust him to put our trust in him, to follow Jesus, his son.